Great. Um, thank you. Welcome, everyone. We are happy to be here on the Sports Tech panel and very really excited to have a, a, a nice, uh, uh, you know, interesting panel here today and looking forward to a, a, a nice, healthy conversation. And, and I hope, and I, I apologize, I'm trying to make sure I, we navigate this correctly. I hope there is there's a, a chat function on the uh, within this um, virtual call. And if you guys want to participate and utilize the chat, I will try to navigate that in between some of our conversations as well. So um, by all means, we want to make this interactive and make this an enjoyable uh, conversation. So um, with that, we will um, we can jump right into it. So. Thank you, everyone. G good morning. Um, my name is Yang Adija. I am um, the head of business operations and strategy for Turner Sports, and I'll help try to moderate and you know uh, be a participant and get out of the way of some good conversation that we'll have today. And uh, I'll do a a brief and quick introduction of our panelists here, and then I will leave it up to them to you know, talk a little bit more about their their perspective, respective roles and, and engagement in their with their organizations. So in no particular order here, I will start out with uh, Chris Pantoya. So Chris Pantoya is the chief commercial officer and head of strategy for fan controlled football. And fan controlled football is a new interactive football league preparing to launch the next generation of sports that delivers to uh, fans by fans. So I'm, I'm really interested in, in digging in a little bit more there and, and hearing how, um, what good things they, you guys have going over there at um, Fan Control Football. So uh, thank you, Chris, for joining. And um, we'll, we'll sort of walk through the introductions all in total first, and then we'll, we'll kick it off. Um, next is uh, Andrew Barge. Um, Andrew is at Twitter. So Andrew leads business development and content partnerships for sports news and entertainment in the US. And he's responsible for driving uh, new deals from companies announcements you know, at CES to new fronts, um, to the N NBA, NFL, World Cup and Olympics. Um, so Andrew does quite a bit of things with, with Twitter and, and we'll jump into Andrew's background on there there as well. So really excited and thank you, Andrew, for being part of the panel and looking forward to uh, additional conversation around that. And then uh, Morgan, uh, Morgan Drake. Uh, so Morgan Drake is the founder and CEO of Fanboard. Um, and Fanboard is the, uh, provides augmented reality experiences that you know, delight fans uh, attending sports events while increasing attendance and sponsorship revenue. So, um, you know, thank you, uh, Morgan, for joining as well, and looking forward to hearing more about what you're what you're doing over there at at Fanboard as well. So, so with that, I, I will I will sort of get out of the way in terms of the introductions and um, really looking to dive into uh, some more in depth conversations. But before I do that. Um, I do want to kind of, you know, go to each of you just to talk a little bit about what you do at your respective companies and just elaborate on the uh, the introduction that I gave. And I guess I will start out with uh, with you, Chris. All right. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Um, so good to be here. And as you mentioned, I'm the chief commercial officer and head of strategy with Fan Controlled Football. And I very often get the question like, so is that a video game or is that real football? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, really it's an opportunity for fans to interact with our live athletes playing a live game of football, but the fans make all the decisions, right? So they get to pick the players that come into the league, help work up the, the playbook, the master playbook for the league, all the way through to weekly drafting players to their team and then calling plays for the, the team itself. And so uh, we're getting ready to launch in February uh, 2021, our, our first season, and it'll actually be down in Atlanta. So we will be playing in a single location and uh, really excited to redefine the ways in which fans can engage in sports. It's kind of like becoming a GM of your team while being a coach and so forth. So really excited to get going. 
Uh, and, and my role with the company is focused on distribution partnerships and making sure that we get all of our great content and influencers content out there for fans to engage in the way that they want to engage. And the second piece, uh, as head of strategy, I'm also helping us focus on what comes next. We believe that because it's an immersive next-gen sports platform that we're building, uh, we have visions for going beyond American football into baseball, cricket, you name it. So uh, really start to look at some of those things after we have our first successful season in February. So thank you again for having me. Great. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. And I guess I'll stay in the same order. I'll go to, go to Andrew. Great. Uh, thanks, Yang, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I oversee content acquisition for, for Twitter, specifically um, premium video assets from content partners across our news, entertainment, and sports um, verticals. But I've, I started in sports managing broadcast partnerships um, at Twitter. and I've been at Twitter for a little over six years. So um, I, I still I still feel rooted in in this landscape, even though um, my remit is, is a bit broader. But uh, we have agreements in place with, with all the leagues and networks um, um, to bring real-time highlights and even live video and engagement franchises like Votes and um, Twitter Moments and Q&As to serve both sports fans and, and advertisers alike um, on Twitter in the process. And we refer to this business as Twitter Amplify. It was actually born out of sports partnerships about eight years ago. Um, Twitter is a real-time platform, as I think we all know, that really augments live TV effectively. And, and the nature of live sports enables us to serve sports fans in a really complimentary and, and, and additive manner. It could be a, a clip of a touchdown uh, just moments after it happens. It could be an impromptu fan vote to watch uh, a, a, a live player specific camera angle, which is uh, yanks some of the stuff we do with you guys in, in NBA digital. Um, we, we like to think of of Twitter as as sports bridge to the smartest and funniest and ultimately most engaged fans in the world. And and that's the foundation um, for, for why leagues and networks and teams and athletes um, all work for us or all work with us. Um, so uh, very excited to dig in on on how how that has evolved during uh, this this uh, crazy time of COVID and, and, and some of the learnings. But uh, thank you guys again for having me. No, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Look, looking forward to diving into some of the things that you guys are dealing with there. And, and as things have evolved, as you mentioned, um, during the pandemic and hopefully what might the future look like. So really excited about that. Um, and Morgan, uh, let's let's go with you and give you give your- well, Thanks so much. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the founder of FanBoard. Uh, we're an ad tech, martech company with a focus in sports and esports. Uh, so our goal is to use new technology to better engage fans, as you mentioned, and also provide optimal brand awareness for advertisers. Uh, so some of the technologies that we like to use are augments in virtual reality, uh, specifically for fan engagement, uh, but then also computer vision, machine learning, and a mixture of AR for ad placement during live streaming and sporting events. So that is actually a new thing that has come out of COVID uh, for us, it's been a, a little bit of a pivot. Uh, as a role, as a founder, uh, I wear lots of hats, <laughs> all the hats in, in some sense, but um, primarily I am uh, doing business development, sales enablement, project management, um, you know, problem solving, um, UI, UX, and you know, trying to best figure out, you know, what are optimal solutions for the problems that we're identifying. Yeah, I, I can imagine there's probably um, a long laundry list of things that you'll also plug in your whole, you're plugging your fingers into the dike as well, just to make sure that things continue to move, so. You're correct on that, yes. <laughs> yeah. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you um, for, for joining and being on the panel. So let's 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 jump into it. I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we will be talking about is just around, you know, COVID and the pandemic and how things have either changed or haven't changed or, or where we think things are going. And I would love to get the collective panel's take on that. But even before we do this, just um, give me a sense of where do you guys think sports, sports viewership and sports fans are today? Like, wh wh where are we? Like, when, when you guys are um, engaging, and, and this is a, a jump ball here, so anyone who wants to, to take this question, but when you, when we look at fans and, and how they're engaging with, with sports, whether it's prior to the pandemic and the other competition that's out there with 
gaming or other things like where do we see the fan today yeah, yeah i would so I, okay. go ahead chris Go ahead. <laughs> so you know i would say that i think for the last couple of years we've been seeing this trend that now is under the microscope and you know heightened because of covid but i think a lot of it has come from fans wanting to get closer to the sport that they're involved with and that they follow and closer to the athletes whether it be understanding what people are doing off the court and off the field and you know what drives them and how they prepare for their their craft um, you know, I think that the fans really just want to consume everything they possibly can. And I also think there's this appetite to be the first in on a piece of information and that discovery to then share it with friends to say, I am such an avid fan that I discovered the following. You've got to jump in and figure this out with me right now. So I think that has been something coming for a couple of years. And I know, like you said, we'll talk about COVID and how that's just probably accelerated and opened up the the, the opportunity even more. But that's my perspective on what I've seen from fans the last couple of years in sports. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, it's to me, it's the it's the fan empowerment era of sports. I think I think fan controlled football is probably like the most literal representation of that. Like I, Chris, it's very much your your world, but um, we, we, from our vantage point, um, sports organizations lean into platform like ours because they care deeply about what um, their fans think. Um, we're a customer service platform of sorts for, for better or worse sometimes, but um, it, it enables leagues and teams to, to listen and serve their fans in interesting ways. And um, the sports experience, whether it's the broadcast, whether it's 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 um, new ventures, whether it's 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 new verticals, it's just more participatory. And it's it 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 feels like fan voices have never been more influential um, than they have now. And we we see that through our, our most high profile partnerships every day. And just to uh, add on to that, I, I really think that COVID has shown that sports is more or less a necessity. Um, there's something that brings us all back to normal. As long as we can see our sports happening and we can have that interaction, uh, I think this has really propelled that um, the interactive uh, piece of the puzzle, as you guys had mentioned. Um, it was really great to see the creativity come out of how are we going to make this happen, how this uh, show most, must go on uh, that happened with the leagues uh, was uh, really great to see. Uh, I love the, um, the abilities for – uh, fans to put themselves in the stands, uh, brands to do the same. Teams got very creative with who they were presenting. Uh, so even if fans couldn't be there on sites, they could participate in, in, uh, in different senses. Um, so again, yeah, I think the interactive piece has definitely accelerated through all this. And I think I really did show that there's a necessity for um, sports and what it means to us as the culture. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with what you guys said more. I mean, you know, during that, you know, quiet time of when there were no sports on, you know, we were, we were just looking and people had a feeling of, you know, missing that community um, that they that they belong to. And, you know, one of the things that we've always seen is that there's a, a greater evolution and in, in people wanting to know more, wanting to know the, the athlete even more. And so that that evolution has was certainly starting even before COVID, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, as, as we know, this the pandemic has has accelerated a, a lot of that, um, and so with that, I, I would love to know from as as we ventured and and, and now are you know, actually deep within the still this pandemic, um, what what things have have evolved, changed in your space in regards to the, uh, or have you seen trends that have have been highlighted that you've seen from the fans that you think are either have stopped things that were done in the past or will be things that you think have, you know, are going to be accelerated in the future. Um, and, you know, or hints of things that you're like, Hey, this is something that we should be looking out for. And, and I guess I'll, I'll start with Andrew on that one. Yeah. I, um, I think leagues, as I mentioned, have already have always really um, I think embraced social because it's a it's a unique way to to reach their 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 fans. But COVID really necessitated that 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 shift because they were having to grapple with sports and fanless arenas. Um, um, how do you how do you how do you serve tens hundreds of millions of fans without um, the 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 live game experience as you've as you've as you've known it. 
Um, and, and Twitter was able to play a crucial role here in, in two inverted manners. One, just bringing fans' voices to the arena, and the other, extending the arena to the fans on Twitter, uh, that, that, that virtual uh, fan notion. And in bucket one, I alluded to fan empowerment earlier, the NBA needed to give fans a voice in the bubble. So our, our solution to that was, was um, literally integrating fan tweets on monitors into the arena and replying to those tweets with photos of them in the arena with, with, with players around the monitors, even, even allowing tweet volume um, to influence crowd noise that's that's pumped into the arena. So so allowing um, hashtags of specific teams to dictate the the literal volume of the arena. Um, it 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 just reflects um, the NBA's willingness to experiment. And and um, even though fans weren't physically there, they they were still um, keeping that audience top of mind and in, in, in empowering them to influence the the game day experience. Um, we saw we saw an even more literal version of this with. Major League Baseball um, before the the World Series, they printed tweets on on batting practice balls and and actually mailed them back to fans after after they were hit in live. So you're you're literally like bringing fans' voices to the diamond. And again, Ma Major League Baseball has has, has done um, fun. Um, I think I think fan empowerment initiatives over the years, but but never anything that intimate and in that that premium. And um, I think I think COVID in just really, really cutting down on the fan experience re required that level of commitment and thinking. Um, and, and when we also think about, okay, versus bringing fans to the arena, how do we, how do we bring um, the, arena, the arena to the fans on Twitter? Uh, the NFL does something called the Showtime Cam every week where players celebrate in the, in the end zone. There's a special camera there that, that uh, produces these, these intimate celebration videos and they're published on Twitter immediately after each touchdown. Um, so fans on Twitter are getting this like unique up close look at the field. And, and again, this wasn't, this wasn't a vantage point that, um, that, that we've been able to offer fans. We've done live games with the NFL on Twitter. We've done hundreds of, of real time highlights for, for years, um, every Sunday, but, but, but never, never that level of, of intimacy. And, and, um, COVID has been a, an, an insanely difficult time for all of us, but it, it has been inspiring to see this level of, I think, fan focused commitment, um, come from it and, and um, we expect those uh, those tactics to, to live well beyond the pandemic um, because they've been successful. Anyone else want to weigh in on anything that you've seen has changed or yeah. discontinued? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, kind of building on that that appetite for fans to get closer and more interactive and immersed in the experiences that they're following. Um, you know, we the the concept behind fan controlled football has been around for a handful of years in development, and actually, uh, you know, pretty much arrived on the scene in the middle of the pandemic to do our commercial launch. And um, the thought being that you know it has always been an idea that we would be a purely digital platform for engagement and so we were we were never as focused on the uh you know in-person arena and selling tickets and hot dogs and so forth we just felt like that would get away from the pure digital experience and fan engagement that we were driving after and so you know call it an odd um i guess fortune uh you know we've really launched from that perspective and um, we, starting end of September, we kicked off our fan interactions that started with fans starting to first identify which team they were going to be a part of. So we've got, you know, some big personalities, incredible owners for our teams, uh, you know, between Joe Montana, Mike Tyson, Richard Sherman, Marshawn Lynch, Quavo, uh, Bob Mennery. So as we've, you know, loaded up our teams with these incredible incredible owners, uh, fans have rallied behind the personalities that they want to follow and that they, you know, that most resonate with them and that they want to be a part of as a fan. After doing that, fans were then invited to vote on the team names, which uh, we've just announced actually in the last 24 hours, uh, what the team names will be. And so if you want to check it out at fcf.io, uh, definitely do that. Uh, there were some incredible names, some that were cringeworthy, some that were amazing, you know. Uh, and so those names have been announced. 
Uh, but fans have already started to get into the action. Next, they'll be looking at designing logos for the teams uh, and then starting to get into the recruiting and scouting action with our players. We've had a couple of combines. We're headed to our third soon. Uh, and fans will be interacting with the players increasingly to start helping make those selections of who comes into the league. And then lastly, um, we've been doing things like, you know, as we've put together our rule book, we wanted to make sure that it was taking into consideration the trends of the last couple of years and certainly the trends that have been heightened during COVID being that probably smaller or shorter attention span and the need for faster action, constant action. And uh, one of the things that we did was we really rethought the rules and the format of play. And so while it'll be an indoor seven on seven uh, game, we want to make sure that the rules are really conducive to heavy on offense, you know, highly interactive, minimal game stoppage uh, in order to really keep the fans engaged. And so we will actually be taking some of the rules that we've had um, heated debate internally over at the league level. Uh, we will take those rules out to the fans and kind of show them a scrimmage of version A and version B, which way should the rule play out. And so we'll be finalizing league rules with fan input. Uh, we'll also be inviting fans into our league office uh, team meetings as we get down to brass tacks and really making this lo this this launch come to life. So um, that's been kind of what's been going on for us in, in the midst of COVID uh, relative to fan controlled football. Great, great. I, I see that you um, got some really shy um, owners of your teams there, with <laughs> Marshawn Lynch. <laughs> exactly. You know, we wanted guys that were quiet. You know, right. Much. You know, I would say that the players are equally uh, personable and big personalities. Uh, you know, as we look, there are just so many high quality uh, players that, that are wanting to get back into the action and, you know, have stayed in shape and so forth. And so, but they also have their own following and their own kind of, you know, audience and community that they've built around themselves. And so it's an opportunity for them to, to bring those fans into the fold that fan controlled football as well. So, sorry, Morgan, did you want to? Yeah, I'm just going to say for us, just how, you know, talking on personal levels, uh, COVID initially just crushed us. And not like, oh, man, we're crushing it, but, oh, goodness, we're going into hibernation mode. Uh, marketing budgets went to zero. Um, and, you know, even take some of the examples that we've done. We made the VR Golden Spike experience for Atlanta United. And all of a sudden, something that people would freely, you know, take a headset and place on their head and take the foam hammer that's you know that's not going to happen and so we have some new methods into cleaning procedures um but yeah, more importantly though yeah, the other budgets were, were just xed uh but then we found a new problem in that so okay well sports are going to happen but fans aren't going to be allowed to come back into the, to the venues or at least not 100 percent um and so now especially with local sports like high school sports who are dependent on 75 percent of ticket sales for their programs well how do they support that um, well, you have this great opportunity for live streaming. Um, so there is a safe uh, means to do that. Um, and what we're, where we are helping is taking, you know, again, our computer vision or augmented reality to automatically and organically place display ads onto the fields, almost as if they're painted on the fields, but they're not really painted there. And we, again, we can org organically and automatically place those uh, with this new tech. Um, so, yeah, we found some great new problems to have, building new partnerships, and really we've uh, created a whole new uh, type of programmatic advertisement that hasn't existed before um, on a video player. So, uh, yeah, really exciting things now that we're very excited about that we didn't have um, but it come up because of COVID. Right, I think it's like forced, uh, you know, interesting innovations and creativity, you know, due to some of the constraints. Um, and in fact, one, one of the things that I, I'm like, well, why don't we continue that is that, you know, in, in, in some of the NBA games, as you can see, we have the, the, um, the, the wall where you can see the fans, on, you know, virtually. And, you know, even when fans come back, I don't, I don't see any reason why we, we shouldn't have that as an aug augmented experience that people can still, um, you know, get piped in, you know, remotely across the country as, as fans that are watching. So things that hopefully, have a potential to continue even after um, after the the you know the experience. Let's say we get back to to normal, and you know, hopefully there is some sort of new normal that that comes about from this. And 
to use an overused term, but um, you know, certainly it looks like there's a lot of talk here about interactivity and and even you know VR, AR, MR kind of you know you know interactions. Um, what what does normal look like, and and you know, do we get full stadiums back? And and um, if we do, does that pull away from certain things, or do we get people just consuming a lot more? Is that how we're, we're thinking about it? And I asked you guys to go into your crystal balls. Uh, did you guys? Hopefully, you brought brought them today. <laughs> You know, I, I think the, the consumption levels, if you think about it, have continued to go up over probably even beyond uh, outside of the past two years, right? It's probably mm -hmm. been the last five plus years that consumption, total hours consumed on all devices in aggregate have increased. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, while while that at some point probably starts to level out the, the increase in that time, I would think that the time becomes richer and more fulfilling, that mm -hmm. there's more to do and more, more interactivity and so forth. So, you know, I would say we probably will continue to see increased consumption as people take in these new experiences and new immersive moments and then start to level out as to what's the, you know, the collection of things that they like to consume every week or every day. Um, but I, I would say it probably goes up a little bit in total consumption and then levels off at some point in a richer and very different way than we used to see. That's great. That's great. Do, do, sorry, Marvin, you're going to say something? I was just about to say, yes. Yeah, so I, what my crystal ball is telling me that from outside the venue, uh, yeah, streaming is get, get going to continue to dominate more platforms, like along with the, the broadcast stations that now have their streaming capabilities, Fubo, Sling, Pluto, all these others will continue to come out. Um, there will be advances in AR, new graphics, um, uh, things that you've kind of seen but will evolve. Um, I think this will also come with new sensors like that are on, on players uh, around uh, the venues. That's going to create more data that gives the ability to get very creative with um, the different uh, artificial graphics that you can create. Um, I think you're also going to see new things about how you how are you capturing the game. Uh, maybe drones are going to be more heavily involved, uh, body cams uh, that will require stabilizing technology, but I don't think we're far out from that. Um, so you're going to get a, view, a fun viewpoint of what players are seeing, and that makes for a great VR experience where you can watch that from inside or outside the venue. Um, so yeah, there's new technology that has to happen, and I think that this is helping us to accelerate that. Now, um, inside the venue, the, the ticket sales have been competing with um, broadcast for years now, and it's the convenience level has been very hard to beat. And now you have an extreme uphill battle because now you have to, you know, it's the whole COVID thing. And are, am I ever really healthy and safe? Uh, is feeling safe there? So obviously those are going to be the very first things I'll need to uh, change and just your experience of going to the ballpark or to the arena is new ways of um, how, you know, line management, for example. Uh, I don't, it, whether getting in, waiting for the restroom, uh, these are things that I think you're going to see a lot of advancement and really cool tech, but I think it's also going to be just very simple um, logistics, pro, you know, solutions that aren't requiring necessarily a lot of heavy tech, uh, but will be very effective. Um, so companies maybe like fan food when it comes to ordering uh, and then delivering food. So there's less touch there. Uh, this could be applied to, you know, touchless for all purchases, whether it's food or, um, you know, new merchandise. Uh, but then I think you're really going to need to create a spectacle in order to attract people into this venue. So I think that's where the AR uh, element comes in where, you know, a mixture of new AR headsets from Unreal, HoloLens 2, the new Snap Spectacles, we're getting closer to uh, hardware that actually can do something powerful. And what we can get to with that, maybe a mixture of projection screens or even transparent screens that, uh, you know, are in between the, uh, the stands and the, the fields, you're gonna be able to do a lot of great things that, you really physically can't do, but you can now do them with these effects. So using pyrotechnics that aren't even capable because they would actually kill people, but you can do it with AR or turning Mercedes-Benz Stadium into a giant version of the Georgia Aquarium. Like you're really just, you're not limited to anything uh, once these technologies are all form into place. I think the Hawks have been a great example of making those steps up with the 3D um, printing on uh, display printing on the courts. 
And now I think this is going to force uh, all arenas to do similar things on a, a more grand scale because you're going to want you want to give some the people there you know something worth seeing you know on um, really uh, again give them a spectacle. That's interesting. No, I, I appreciate that, Morgan. That's that's an interesting point in that you know what the this pandemic has done, as we said, it's accelerated a number of things. One is the innovation that happens around not having to go to you know stadiums and, and arenas to to enjoy and bring as as Andrew you mentioned bringing the stadium to the the um, fans outside. Um, but then once we sort of get past this, the the other challenge will be you know habits have been formed, people are enjoying the games you know in different ways that are not at the stadium. So then the innovation comes, well, how do you then create um, a need for people to want to go to that live event? And yes, there are some people that you know want to go to live no matter what, but there is a different now different competition there of how do we get people back in? And it can't be, it probably won't be the same experience that it was prior to the pandemic. It can't just be like, hey, the game is here, because now if you're getting such a great experience at, at home, how, how else can you increase that um, experience in, in the arena? Um, and so I guess both Chris or Andrew, um, as you guys are thinking about, particularly with fan control, I know there's um, a sort of a gaming compo component to it. Are you guys thinking about that? live experience and, and how do you get people to come back in there, um, even when they feel, I'll call it relatively safe about the, the environment? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would speak to it at a holistic engagement level, because mm -hmm. I think, you know, the, the whole thing is about how do you, how do you really engage people in a lasting way, whether on digital or in person? And so, you know, one of the other elements that I know Morgan touched on a lot of the, the technology based uh, items, which totally agree with as an opportunity to drive that ongoing engagement. Uh, but the other is, I think it's always helpful when there's a vested interest on the mm -hmm. fans part. And so whether it's, you know, they've taken a bet and they're excited to kind of see that through and, and they're engaged from that perspective. Or in the case of our sport, one of the things that, you know, it's really centered around is this whole fan leaderboard. And so much like in a video game, you know, the fans will also be keeping score on how well they've done their play calling, how well they've done their draft picks. And it'll translate directly into on-field advantage in that they can win as fans on the leaderboard, you know, they can win a fifth down for their team. They can win additional timeouts, that mm -hmm. type of thing. And so I think all of a sudden, when you've got one of those types of um, vested stakes on your the part of your fans, uh, they're going to want to come to events in person. They're going to want to be there live on digital. And so I think that's really important. And and some of what uh, you know our business model is wrapped around, and what I think we'll see in the future. That's great. And then I know Andrew, I know you mentioned a little bit before about bringing that experience both both ways. And so as you guys think from from Twitter's perspective as like certainly enhancing the away from the arena experience. Are you guys thinking about anything in terms of, you know, helping to enhance the, you know, live and in person experience as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I um, the, the normalcy question is an interesting one because on one hand, it's like, we didn't have Wimbledon, March Madness, or the Olympics this year. So it's it's been like the least normal year of sports from like a, a, a logistical vantage point. And I'll, I'll consider normal when we can look at a calendar and not worry about whether or not an event's can actually happen or, or not. And so um, that, that that's like a very fundamental um, reality. But in terms of, of strategy or philosophy, it, it, it feels like it, it, it feels pretty normal, as crazy as that sounds like our partners are still asking us for the same thing. Like there's a, there's a heightened sense of urgency and, and, and maybe um, more importance to these asks. Uh, but, but for the, for as long as Twitter sports has existed, we've been asked by teams how to um, bring the, the energy and, and um, um, just, just general uh, fan connection of Twitter into the arena. We have partners like Tagboard and um, 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 Sprinkler and others that have innovative votes and, and giveaways. And um, um, we have cameras in certain arenas that take photos of 
of, of, of fans in an arena and we'll reply to them on Twitter so that there's that, that, that feedback loop and that recognition that they're there. And um, um, that, that gamification is, is interesting. And we, we work closely with that ecosystem to, to push the envelope there. But um, as, as I mentioned, there's, a, there's an equal focus on, um, on bringing the arena experience to, to Twitter. And that can come in a, in a literal commerce capacity, right? Like we get asked by the NBA, you know, help us drive um, awareness and adoption of our League Pass product. Um, help us uh, ensure that that that, that fans are, are are going to the arena. Can we measure that? Can we find unique ways to market that? So, um, we we as partners, we try really hard to um, consider the 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 holistic business needs of our partners first versus the stuff that can be most easily easily addressed by a platform like Twitter. Um, and that, that, that requires us to consider the in arena experience um, because we, we know how crucial that is to the broader health of, of, of sports leagues. No, that, that's great and I appreciate it. Um, I, just, I just noticed, I know that we've had some questions come in from the, um, from the audience and don't think they're seeing the, the response back. So I, I'll, I'll read out some of the, the questions that are here uh, just for us to give some audio response to it as well. Um, so the, the first that I see here is, um, huh. I guess for Andrew, when can we expect Twitter cams in stadiums? Yeah, that's that's almost a question for you, Yang, because we have those <laughs> with the NBA every Thursday, NBA yeah. Twitter Live, which is which is um, um, one of one of my favorite partnerships. We. Um, Paul, I don't know if you're aware, but we 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 host a, a live vote on Twitter every Thursday during the NBA season, mm -hmm. allowing fans to vote on an individual player that they want to see as an ISO cam for the second half of, of an NBA on TNT uh, Thursday night game. We do it during the playoffs, and um, it's one of my it, it, it's it's often you know LeBron versus Steph Curry versus Giannis, and um, obviously when we think about Twitter cams, we have to have the linear experience top of mind because cannibalization is a, a, a massive um, point of, of, of sensitivity for our partners. So we, we're really focused on on driving awareness in, in complementary adoption of the linear telecast. And, and we, we, we get that through these real time personalized experiences that in no way um, compete with the actual uh, live game experience. So that's, that, that's kind of how we landed on NBA Twitter Live. and. Our ambition is to extend that that concept to to all leagues and, and sports globally. So, hopefully, yeah. you'll see more of that in the past in the it, in the future. Exactly, and just to add on to that, I think we've done a, an excellent job in terms of really bringing a different viewpoint, different experience, so that it's not a cannibalization; it's just a a, a different experience for the fans to enjoy. And a lot of times, people are watching both. They'll watch the the um, full game um, on on linear or wherever they're getting their, their, the game from. And then at the same time, having that other angle of seeing those individual athletes and, and going through it from their perspective. And I think that there's opportunities just to continue to grow that. Um, the other question that's here is, how can fans get involved with fan control football? Uh, let me tell you. So, uh, you know, first off, uh, go to fcf.io. There's a lot of great information and content there to get you caught up. You haven't missed out totally, so get in there quickly. Um, but the other thing is uh, we're going to be streaming our games live on Twitch throughout the season. So we start shortly after Super Bowl uh, in mid-February, and our games will all be played there. Uh, play calling as well as the draft picks and so forth can all be executed on Twitch. Uh, live and so be sure and check that out. Uh, and and more recently, uh, one of the things we've done in the preseason is we actually just launched the fan controlled show on Twitch, 6 p.m. Eastern, uh, just ahead of uh, you know NFL games. We're we're live and talking about fan controlled. We have some of our great owners and and uh, influencers that are involved with the league. Uh, join the show from time to time. So it's always a surprise, that show. Uh, but be sure and tune in, uh, you know, on Twitch. And then uh, check us out at fcf.io. That's good. Perfect. The uh, next question I have in here, uh, you know, does, Andrew, I guess for you, does Twitter do um, anything with startups and the accelerators? They want to get a sense of if you guys are going to be doing more there. 
Yeah, I'd love. I'd, we'd love to do something more formal, but um, part of our job as a as a partnership team and as a sports team is is closely monitoring the startup ecosystem. We we usually hear about them through our existing partners. Like I'll, I'll hear from Turner, or we'll hear from uh, the Hawks, or uh, some some um, some organization that's 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 really kind of made that 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 first um, uh, initial partnership point and and uh we'll we're, we're always interested whether it's analytics or publishing or um content creation it's 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 um oftentimes startups that surface the biggest issues or biggest opportunities that that twitter has and um we have a corporate development team obviously and and, and others in the company that are more um directly focused on on um uh, that that level of engagement but um my my ambition down the road is for for twitter to to be more formally supportive there but um um in the in the meantime i'm always happy to to hear from uh a, a new organization that has ideas on how twitter can be better and and, and how our partners can um have more success on our platform or, or even more broadly yeah. Yeah. um and i'm just also trying to be mindful of time here, but so another another question here, um, I guess again for for Andrew for you, if, um, can we expect more live stream on Twitter, um, and especially women's sports like NWSL? Yeah, so. it's a, that's a huge that's a huge point of focus for us. Um, um, I can't speak to NWSL specifically, um, although big big fan of the the product and the organization. Mm -hmm. um but but women's sports is an underserved community on twitter and frankly everywhere and um it's it's a it's a it's an investment priority for us we we extended our partnership with the WNBA this past summer um really doubling down after a multi-year agreement um very very excited about the direction that that league is heading in and um that's not going to be the last um you you see from us in that space so so stay tuned so when I do this, um, as I said, just uh, coming up on 45 here, just give everyone a chance to any closing remarks in regards to what, you know, what you see coming in the future, what you guys are working on, the pandemic, sports fans, anything else that you guys want to say just to, to, to wrap things up here or anything else that you want to say that's probably um, hasn't been mentioned within these questions or highlighted um, from each one of the organizations. And um, I guess I'll, I'll start with you, Chris, and we can work our way okay. around. Yeah, you know, I would just, uh, this this for me is a call to action to fans that are interested. You know, we, we've talked about how fans have said again and again, they wanna be more interactive. They want more frontline access. And, you know, we're gonna be giving unfettered access to our owners, our players, our, you know, back office. Um, and so I would just really ask the fans to be vocal. You know, we want to hear from the fans and we want to see, you know, what it is that we need to do to impact play, to make it active and, you know, what the fans want. We always say that fan controlled football is for the fans and by the fans. And so I would just make it a call to action to say, hey, we want to see you on FCF.io and uh, hope to see you on Twitch uh, engaging with our owners and players and really starting to make this league come to fruition. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about that. And so February, right? Official. You got it. February. Yep. Okay. Mid-February, we will be on uh, on Twitch streaming live and starting with our, our first ever draft, live draft, which will be weekly. So uh, lots of opportunities to get involved starting now uh, with fan controlled football. So really That's appreciate right. it and look forward to seeing fans out there. And it's and it's Atlanta. So, you know, we got it. We got it. We have to show up, Atlanta. <laughs> Exactly. Come on, Atlanta. Show us what you can do. <laughs> right. Um, so I guess uh, Morgan, I'll go to I'll go to you next in terms of final. Uh, well, you just said um, Atlanta. I, that's actually what I would like to use these closing remarks to say thank you to the ecosystem here and the partners. Uh, I would like to do a shout out to Boomtown. Uh, I went to their uh, Boulder Accelerator Program just a few years ago. Uh, they're now at the farm with Comcast. Uh, love you guys. Um, Prototype Prime, Peachtree Corners, um, and there's there's such a great ecosystem. I even worked at a uh, startup at the uh, debut Tech Stars cohort. Um, from I mean, there's just there's so many great uh, programs to help startups uh, within the this city. So thank you for doing this. Um, I'm very grateful to you know help participate in this. And so yeah, just thank you and 
go Atlanta. Yeah, exactly. And Andrew, I'll give you a. Yeah, e echo echo everything Morgan just said. I'm 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 a huge fan of the farm as well, and looking forward to getting more involved uh, di directly and and um, to. Uh, the earlier question, hopefully using that as a, a jumping off point for Twitter to be to be more involved in not not just the farm specifically, but the broader Atlanta ecosystem because there's there's so much energy and innovation happening there. Um, I think I've I've probably beaten the the participation drum hard enough over the last few questions, but I I do I do think the future of sports viewership is is so personalized that the the notion of of one um, one national telecast to watch a game, I think that's going to seem incredibly antiquated. I think the fact that it's like a one-way viewing experience, it's an amazing experience, but it's, it's so kind of uniform. Um, I think it's, uh, I, I, I think we're heading in a direction where fans are going to have so much choice in, in so much customization at their, at their fingertips. And that's where you can inject things like gamification or or betting or AR or whatever but but like i mean a great example is from the golf world it's masters week which is weird but but uh it's, it's topical um pga tour um back in uh march announced uh, an initiative around the players championship their biggest tournament to allow fans behind their subscription product to follow every shot from every golfer the entire tournament, which is wild. Like golf is one of the most expensive and technical sports to produce. It's why so much of it doesn't live on linear TV, but the tour found a way to offer um, an entire field, every single shot for four days to, to, to be, to be watched at the individual viewer level. And um, that unfortunately got cut short by COVID, but just the, the, the fact that that exists, I think is a good representation of like how much these leagues care about, consumer choice and in, in really investing in the technology to make that happen. Um, our partnership with the tour is similar to other leagues in that we have free golf on Twitter every morning of every tour event and fans can vote on which featured group they want to see. So um, my, my parting line is I, I know a lot of these organizations can feel massive and, and impersonal at times, but um, if you, if you, if you see the, the, the tactics and the initiatives, it's all very, very, fan centric and in 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 focused on um the most customizable viewer experience as possible and I, I think that's gonna extend into the 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 more legacy linear spaces that that really drive scale today. And it's something I'm I'm personally both that as a Twitter employee and as a fan really, really excited about. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I guess, you know, from my side in terms of last um words here is that, you know, at Turner Sports, we, we are continuing to look to innovate there as well. We've been um, doing POCs around um, video gaming and how that's evolved and grown quite a bit during this pandemic and how we um, are creating sports around that. We're actually doing some things around um, sports and blockchain and how that impacts the direction that, we, that we're going. Um, yeah, um, I appreciate it, Andrew. You mentioned betting that we didn't even get a chance really to talk a lot about that's also another area that's growing, um, you, know, you know, quite rapidly, and us, you know, figuring out both with the leagues as well as outside in terms of how how we participate there. And so I think that those are really uh, growing spaces. And you know, um, at Turner Sports, we also want to make sure that you know we continue to stay engaged and involved with the the startup community because that's where a lot of these. Um, Forward-leaning ideas are coming from, and I and I'm I'm um, feel blessed and happy to you know be on this panel with you guys as I hear some new things and direction that you guys are going. And believe me, I will be reaching out to each one of you um, as they, as you guys continue to evolve. Um, and so you know, tech stars in the community and the startup community here in Atlanta, I think um, a lot of great things are going on, and we're really looking forward to. Um, not just what comes out of the pandemic, but just what comes out in terms of the next few months, year, and in the future of all uh, this innovation. So excited about it. Excellent. Well, thank you guys very much. I um, really enjoyed the conversation. I feel like I've I've gained and learned a lot. You know, I, I this is like um, I've been I've been kind of dabbling around in the gaming space, and it's always like you know. When you when you level up each each time you go through something, I think I've just leveled up by uh, having this panel. So uh, thank you guys very much, and uh, looking forward to uh, future conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Yang. All right. Take care. Thanks. So